I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we bring you the latest news from the battlefront, discuss the Russian strike on a hotel and pizza restaurant in Pokrovsk, and we interview Frederick Kagan, senior fellow and director of the Critical Threats Project at the American Enterprise Institute on the continuing Ukrainian counteroffensive. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. We need a military strategy for Ukraine to gain a decisive advantage on the battlefield, to win the war. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Tuesday, the 8th of August, one year and 165 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today, I'm joined by Associate Editor Dominic Nichols, Assistant Comment Editor Francis Sternley, Senior Foreign Correspondent Roland Oliphant, and our guest today is Frederick Kagan. I started by asking Dom for the latest news from Ukraine. Well, hi, David. Hi, everybody. So let's go east. Russian forces have launched missile strikes on the eastern city of Pokrovsk. That's uh, the the figures so far. Killed eight, uh, injured, I think, 31, the last number I saw. Hit a uh, block of flats, a restaurant and a local hotel um, prominently used, known to be used by journalists. Dozens injured, uh, including 19 police officers, five rescuers and a child. President Zelensky said uh, Russia had struck, quote, an ordinary residential building. He published footage of a fairly typical kind of Soviet era five story building that's had the top floor utterly destroyed. So Pokrovsk is uh, we're now 60 K northwest of the city of Donetsk. It's been uh, it's about 30 miles from the front line, pre-war population of about 60,000 people. There are reports that emergency services were responding to the first missile strike when they were caught in the second, about 40 minutes later. And there are, as I say, rescuers and military among the dead. We're going to hear more about that a little bit later from Roland, who has been uh, there. But I'll just carry on with the news for now. So now let's go to the southwest, uh, to the Khazan front. There are unconfirmed reports in the last hour, albeit from reputable sources, of a Ukrainian assault uh, around the area of uh, Kozachi Lahiri, which is south of the Dnipro River. We're about 20 k's east of Hezon City now. We're on the south side, on the left bank. Um, rivers, as I keep saying, river, we describe rivers the way they flow. So if you're flowing down the Dnipro, the left bank is the sort of southern and the eastern bank, uh, ostensibly the, the bank held by Russia, if you like. But there have been various reports of, of uh, Ukrainian raiding parties going across the river. Whether or not they've been able to establish bridgeheads in the past, it's been debated because we're not really sure the news that comes out of there. So this operation, we think, started a couple of days ago, but the operational security around it meant that we just weren't getting any news. However, multiple pro-Russian sources have expressed their concern, their words, concern of the situation, saying that this time a bridgehead has been established and there are some sources, albeit Uh, the Russian mill blogger community, saying that the first line of Russian defence along that front has been broken. We will keep an eye on it, obviously, uh, because any move there, any significant move there, could force Russian troops to redeploy back to the Hezon region away from Zaporizhia front lines. Now, elsewhere, uh, Putin's ordered the head of of a state-owned defence conglomerate to increase the production of attack drones. There was another very cringeworthy televised uh, meeting last night. Putin was seen ordering the head of Rostec. So this that company produces about 90% of the equipment used in Ukraine. He was ordered to increase the number of weapons being churned out. So Putin said Russia needed more Cub and Lancet drones and also called for more T-90 tanks and other aircraft systems. I think it's the the clearest sign yet that his three-week lightning offensive is proceeding exactly according to plan. Now, the Lancet drone, which uh, is proving costly for Ukraine, Joe, our colleague and friend Joe Barnes, interviewed, or he's done a piece in today where he, he interviewed Yuri Sack, who's an advisor to the Ukrainian defence minister. And Mr. Sack said, without giving the Russians credit, it's not a bad bit of kit. This new, so that's the end of the quote, the new version of this single-use Lancet drone, the sort of whatever you want to call it, one-way attack drone, uh, suicide kamikaze drone what have you but the latest range has a uh, sorry, latest version has a range of about 30 miles often seen working in a pair with the second one which does the spotting to then call in an attack 
Small warhead, only about one or two kilograms, so you know less deadly than an artillery shell or a high precision missile, but they're cheap, about thirty-five thousand dollars a pop, and they fly low and slow at about sixty miles an hour. So it's tough for radar systems of traditional air defence uh, units to, to pick it up. Now, so what this calls for is Ukraine having to relearn the skill of what we in the British military call all arms air defense, which is is every person with a gun can bring these things down if they're in range. I used to fly helicopters, as you know. The main threat to us, we used to try and learn all the air defense systems that could come near us and what they look like on our um, on our radar warning receivers and what have you. But actually, because we were flying so low at and sometimes below treetop height, the main threat to us was the bloke having a leak against a tree who sees you and picks up his gun and, and, and rattles you out. There's not a lot of armour on on helicopters, so they're, they're pretty vulnerable. Now, the German Gepard self-propelled anti-aircraft gun, the twin barrel, 25 mil twin barrel guns, is proving very effective in the war. And last month, Berlin promised to send another 45 to keep by the end of this year. But this, these drones, these Lancet drones, are um, proving um, problematic, as are... The Ukrainian drones for Russian forces. This is a one of the one of the lessons that's really coming out of this war is the use of these very cheap and ubiquitous, highly available, easy to train on drones. Now, connected to weapons and procurement, today's British Defence Intelligence message said that Russia's 200,000 strong Rosgvardia National Guard are going to be equipped with heavy weaponry following a new law signed by Putin last Friday. It's thought this decision was made on the back of the uh, Wagner Group's failed sort of dash towards Moscow in in June. All mutiny and no bounty. Thanks, Lisa, for that. Uh, British Defence Intelligence says that despite uh, Zolotov's claims, that is Viktor Zolotov, he's Putin's former bodyguard who leads the Roskvardia, despite his claim that his force performed excellently during the mutiny, there is no evidence Roskvardia carried out any effective action against Wagner at all, which was exactly the type of internal security threat it was designed to suppress. So UK Defence Intelligence briefing ended by saying the move suggests that the Kremlin is doubling down on resourcing Roskvardia as one of the key organisations to ensure regime security. So is this a sign that Putin is is just feeling a little vulnerable? And then just finally on the news, uh, Ukrainian intelligence say they've uh, detained a shop assistant over an alleged plot to assassinate President Zelensky. So this is the SBU, Ukrainian intelligence agency, said yesterday that it detained an unnamed woman who had been gathering intelligence about uh, a visit Mr. Zelensky was making to the Mykolaiv region at the end of July. The informant's tips were supposed to help the Russian military plan an airstrike uh, while Mr. Zelensky was there. That's what they say. And they said, quote, primarily, primarily the suspect was trying to find out the schedule and the itinerary for the head of state's visit to the region. Uh, now, the security agents didn't make any immediate arrest, but placed the woman under surveillance. They intercepted communications, speaking with an unidentified handler from Moscow. SPU said that from that, they were able to discern that the woman was trying to identify the location of electronic warfare systems as well as ammunition warehouses. And they say that this woman was a shop assistant from a store inside a military base on the Black Sea coast town of Oshakiv. This is very roughly halfway between Mikolaev and Odessa, slightly closer to Mikolaev. She had been travelling around the region, photographing military sites and had been asking her friends and work contacts to get information that they subsequently said they, they had no knowledge that it was going to be used against Ukraine. And Ukrainian authorities say she faced up to 12 years in prison if convicted. Thanks very much, Dom. Well, let's go back to this strike on Pokrovsk. Roland, you've been there and stayed there. What can you tell us about it? Yeah, so the missiles have landed pretty much in the centre of town. Pokrovsk, as Dom was saying, is about, I don't know, 30, 40 miles from the line of contact. So it's it's always been considered slightly safer than places like Kramatorsk, which is your other kind of town near to the front where you might base yourself if you're reporting there. And there was one hotel called the Druzhba, which was very popular with journalists, with uh, volunteers, humanitarian workers, soldiers on leave, anybody passing through. That was really the place in town to stay. Next door to that, there is a pizza restaurant called the Corleone, the ground floor of a five-story residential building. And that was the kind of place to go and eat dinner, one of a few options in town. And it looks like uh, the Russians targeted both of those sites deliberately. I believe the Russians have recently said that we were targeting command post. I, 
having been um, I stayed at the Druzhba last time I was in Ukraine back in May and ate at the Corleone and I, I you know rather like the restaurant that was hit in Kramatorsk in June this is a kind of place where you see a mixture of camouflage and civilians but no sign of it being an, an actual military installation of any sort so I'll come back to Kramatorsk in a second. I just wanted to talk about some, a couple of witnesses we've spoke to. So this morning I spoke to a woman called Arena. She used to work in the Hotel Druzhba. She's now an office worker. Her office is about 200 metres away. I'll just read you a quote. I was late at work, and at the time there was an arrival. Arrival is the, the Russian-Ukrainian slang for an incoming shell or missile. I was outside, and I saw the missile flying, and there was an explosion. It was the first strike, and I managed to get out of there 10 minutes before... They hit the hotel um, before the second one hit the hotel. I knew that if there was one strike, there'd be another. So I didn't even go to the place of the strike. She said she could hear people screaming, but she was too scared to, to hang around um, and investigate. She said there was no air raid warning um, before it happened. She said um, the, f- the first missile hit the, the building that was housing the pizza restaurant. The second one hit the hotel. Now, it's interesting. She mentions being, you know, I know there's been a strike, there might be another one. It's called a double tap, and I'm sure we're probably all familiar with them, but the idea is you drop a bomb or a missile or something, you wait for rescue security services to arrive, and then 10, 15, 30 minutes later, you hit it again to get more casualties. It's something the Russians did very systematically in Syria during their intervention there. I must say, in Ukraine, it's definitely known about, it definitely happens, and hence this woman describing knowing she had to get away but I'd say it is less systematic in Ukraine. They definitely use it there, but I've been on site on missile strike impacts, you know, within 10 minutes, half an hour, no second strike has arrived. In, in this particular case, it does look like uh, that specific strike, the, the governor of Donetsk region has described it as such, and that is also a parallel with the strike on Rear Pizza in Kramatorsk back in June. Again, two Iskander missiles, the same kind of missile, Two of them at once to maximise casualties. Um, another one of the uh, another one of the casualties was uh, a police officer by the name of Volodymyr Nikulin. He's 52. I mean, if you've seen the film about Mariupol, about the AP journalists who who were in Mariupol at the beginning of the war last year, he's in that. He's one of the officers who helped them escape. In fact, so he was in town. He was on the scene after the first strike very quickly. He was performing first aid. We got through to him on the phone very briefly this morning, and then second strike came in. He finds himself on the floor, finds himself administering first aid to himself. When we spoke to him, he was in the back of an ambulance. He'd been stabilised. He was on the way to a hospital to have, he said it was to have bits of shrapnel pulled out of his lung. So pretty badly hurt, but well enough to speak and stabilised since last night. So those are the details we have. I suppose the takeaway is, you know, Pekrovsk is no longer, no place in Ukraine is ever safe. But there was certainly a sense that maybe it's time to start basing yourself there and do your reporting runs further up the road in, into Kramatorsk and, and towards Bakhmut and things like that, rather than staying right in Kramatorsk because of the threat of this kind of thing. But it looks like they, they've decided to target exactly the same um, kind of concentration, the same kind of hospitality infrastructure, I, I, I suppose you'd, tell, you'd call it. Thanks very much, Dom and Roland. Before we go to our guest, Francis, would you like to give us just a couple of diplomatic and political updates that you've been looking at? Thanks, David. I know we'll be discussing the state of the counteroffensive today and we continue to learn more every day about what occurred in the early days and weeks of the offensive, which in turn is shaping the Western reaction. So a battalion commander has warned Ukraine's Marines lost a lot of men in the early days of the counteroffensive with new recruits left mentally broken by the battles they endured. I lost a lot. Alexander, 28, the battalion commander of the 37th Marine Brigade, told the New York Times and some of the new guys are mentally broken, he added. Another, Valerie Marcus, a sergeant major from the 47th Separate Mechanised Brigade, asked to be demoted in a Facebook post criticising his superiors for incompetence and their disregard for the morale of his men as they fought in the Zaporizhia region. Others complained that they've been given equipment unfit for the task of fighting their Russian occupiers, uh, such as the American Max Pro Armoured Fighting Vehicle, which was designed for battling a counterinsurgency. They said they'd also argued with trainers in the US who failed to adapt to the needs of men. Uh, They've thought in Afghanistan, one said, and the enemy there is not like the Russians. 
Now, we don't know how widespread this is, but it does tally with what we've been hearing for some time now. It has sparked more public criticism of Kyiv's military leadership, as well as the Western training and equipment provided to troops from Ukraine's allies. More worryingly for Kyiv, this is bleeding through to the political realm. A scepticism has taken root, whether justified or not. In its negative form, one hears people whisper that Ukraine cannot win. In its more positive form, perhaps, people say that Ukraine is doing well to resist Russian pressure and all it needs is more weapons and capabilities in order to succeed. Olaf Scholz, the German Chancellor, of course, is under mounting pressure by two party allies to further ramp up his military support for Kyiv by delivering Taurus cruise missiles. So Andreas Scholz, a member of his Social Democratic Party, told the German newspaper Der Spiegel, the counteroffensive is faltering. The Ukraine does not have a significant air force to support it. That leaves only guided missiles such as Taurus cruise missiles, with which the Ukrainian army could overcome the minefields laid by the Russians and recapture territory. And his comments were echoed by Neil Schmid, the party's foreign affairs spokesman in the Bundestag. Conversely, therefore, the faltering counteroffensive, if indeed it is faltering, may have advantages for Ukraine in the long term if it leads to this further ramping up of military support and supplies. Interestingly, in his nightly address late on Sunday, Zelensky hailed the significant results of US and German-made air defence systems in defending the country from aerial assaults. He said that his forces had shot down almost 250 missiles and drones, including the hypersonic missiles, which Russia once claimed, of course, were unstoppable, as we reported at the time. The US, too, is continuing its support. As soon as today, it's set to send uh, the first $200 million worth of weapons aid to Kyiv as it starts to dole out the cash from a Pentagon accounting error that overvalued billions of dollars of Ukraine aid. Uh, Tuesday's expected announcements uh, would be the first tranche of a $6.2 billion windfall of previously authorised presidential drawdown authority. So that includes uh, mine clearing equipment, TOW and AT4 anti-tank weapons, guns and ammunition, air defence interpreters, a cacophony of, of, of things that will no doubt be valuable. The UK too is also ramping up its sanctions. It's added 19 new designations to its Russia sanctions list and six to the Belarusian equivalent. Among them are executives of the Iranian drone maker supplying Russian forces and individuals and businesses in Turkey, Dubai, Slovakia and Switzerland who are supporting the illegal war in Ukraine. And just finally, it is worth remembering that Russia has had to double its defence budget for 2023 as a consequence of all this, with its military spending now accounting for a third of all government outlay amid the war. Moscow raised its target to more than 80 billion for this year as the costs of its offensive spiral and place growing strain on Russia's finances. Moscow used to pride itself on surplus state budgets, but has been running a deficit since the start of the invasion. The country's budgetary crunch has been compounded, of course, by Western sanctions and a significant decline in export revenues. Public filings suggest that funding for hospitals and schools has been squeezed since the start of the war at the expense of increased defence spending. So it is impacting the lives of ordinary Russians. But the great question at this stage is when it really is beginning to bite for the Russian public as a whole. Are we talking months or are we talking years? Either way, it is evidently not sustainable, yet Russia has done a good job of convincing the world that it is. Thank you very much, Dom, Francis and Roland. Well, let's turn to our guest, Frederick Kagan, Senior Fellow and Director of the Critical Threats Project at the American Enterprise Institute. Frederick, we we wanted to talk to you more about the Ukrainian counteroffensive. So so let's start with just, it would be great to hear your thoughts on what you thought, what did you expect to see before it actually started? Well, uh, a lot of people thought that the Ukrainians would uh, conduct a relatively conventional mass mechanized counteroffensive that would break through Russian lines and uh, drive relatively rapidly into the rear. And the Ukrainians sort of tried that a little bit, although they were relatively tentative in their efforts to do so, which I think turned out uh, well for them, actually, because they discovered that the combination of the soldiers that they had with the 
training that they'd been given and the kit that they had uh, were really not suitable for engaging in that kind of massed mechanized uh, counteroffensive in the face of the defenses the Russians had established. So uh, there was an initial uh, hope in my part, expectation, I think, on the part of some others that they would be able to do that kind of massed mechanized drive. But in the end, honestly, they didn't really try uh, something like that. And I think on balance and retrospect, that was uh, wise. What, if anything, has surprised you about the past few months? Uh, the Russian defences were better than we thought they would be. The team at the Institute for the Study of War that I work with and I had seen the rows of entrenchments and so forth going up. We had not seen the minefields, which the Russians laid very extensively and very skillfully. And beyond that, it turns out, unfortunately, that the Russian units defending in the Western Zaporizhia area in particular, which had been given actually many months with very little activity to focus on establishing the defenses and their tactics, practiced and developed very good doctrinal defensive tactics, what we've described as an elastic defense, where they allow the Ukrainians to penetrate through their first line of defense, but then exhaust themselves in the attack. And then Russian forces that are in positions in further in the rear are able to counterattack and push them back. This is a very excellent form of defense to use against, especially limited mechanized attack. And the Russian units, particularly, we're talking about the elements of the 58th Combined Arms Army that are in Western Zaporizhia, had obviously rehearsed this and have been executing it effectively. So bringing all that together, I mean, do you think that the West underestimated the Russian army? I think that the West has been off in its estimations of both sides in various different ways. I think the West underestimated what the Ukrainians would have needed in terms of equipment training and time to be able to conduct a massed mechanized penetration of a prepared defensive position. And I think there was and remains excessive expectation in some parts of the West and uh, Western militaries about what a Ukrainian force like this equipped with the relatively small number of systems that are actually appropriate for this kind of mechanized counteroffensive can do. I think there's good news here, which I'm happy to go into, if you'd like. Yes, absolutely. I think this is the moment where we potentially turn this round and say, given everything that you've said, how do you think Ukraine can still win? What do they need to do? And how do you define victory? Well, the def definition of victory, I think, is straightforward. Uh, Ukraine regains um, all of its uh, sovereign territory which is also strategically important for the West. And yes, I do think that Ukraine can still do that. This counteroffensive, especially the initial part of this counteroffensive, was an attempt by the Ukrainians to do something different from what they've done before. It was really an attempt to apply Western tactics and doctrine with some Western kit. But that's not how the Ukrainians have succeeded in the past. And of course, this was also using newly raised units that didn't have a lot of combat experience. So what we're seeing the Ukrainians do now, and they started to do this honestly just a few weeks after they'd begun this phase of the offensive, is to return to the approaches that had led them to success in the Kherson and Kharkiv counteroffensives last year. And that approach relies very heavily on relatively protracted period of interdicting the supply lines. And that's what the, the strikes against the bridges from Crimea to the mainland and the Kerch Strait Bridge and a lot of strikes in Crimea itself have been about. That's a pattern that we saw particularly before the Kherson counteroffensive, but also was relevant for Kharkiv. And then they've brought forward some units that have been fighting for a long time, have uh, the Soviet kit that they're more familiar with. And they've been maintaining limited pressure on the front line as they conduct this interdiction campaign. So I hope and expect that at some point relatively soon, when they've hollowed out the Russian defenses and really interfered with their supplies, which also will reduce Russian morale, which is already very bad, even more that we will begin to see more significant Ukrainian breakthroughs. And here, I think the issue of morale of the Russians becomes very important because it's one thing as a defender when you can stay within your prepared defensive positions and fight 
the adversary as you have expected to fight him. If the Ukrainians can actually get some serious wedges in and start to force the Russians to have to maneuver out of their defensive positions and fight the Ukrainians in more open ground, that's a very difficult thing to do as a defender. And the Russians haven't shown a huge ability to do that in the past. We also know that the Russian units, particularly on this front line, are getting exhausted because they generally haven't been rotated. So the same units are still fighting on the Russian side in Zaporizhia as had been at the start of this counteroffensive, whereas we've seen the Ukrainians rotate fresh units in. At a certain point, units simply become exhausted and demoralized. And so lastly, I would just offer the observation that the shape of the whole theater favors the Ukrainians because the Russian mission is to defend a road and rail line that runs from Rostov in Russia to Crimea. Ukrainians only have to cut that in one place. If the Ukrainians can cut that anywhere, then a lot of the Russian defense to the west of that will collapse. The Russians have to win all across that line all the time. And that's a challenge. So when I put all of these things together and I see the Ukrainians reverting to a form of counteroffensive that we know they've been able to execute in the past, I still think that there's reason to be confident that the Ukrainians can succeed. Thanks so much for that. Just one more question from me before we go to Dom and Francis. Just looking back over the last few months, even for the entire full-scale invasion, what do you think is the most important lesson you've learned from your work? Oh, Lord. I think a huge, well, I mean, the most thing that has been most striking has been the, both the determination and skill and innovation of the Ukrainians to resist this illegal war of aggression. There are a lot of things we could also say about Russian incompetence. I think for the West, the most important thing uh, for us to realize is that if we desire in future to have wars fought on our behalf by other countries and to not be involved in them ourselves, then we have to rethink very fundamentally what kind of kit we produce and how much we produce and how rapidly we can get it to the country that is actually fighting uh, our war. And this has been something that I'm, on the one hand, I obviously give tremendous credit to President Biden and the other Western leaders for getting Ukraine the kit that has allowed it to survive at all. But on the other hand, I think we've generally been a day late and a weapon system short throughout this war. And we've been dribbling supplies in when we really needed, they really needed to be a flood. And I do think that part of the problem the Ukrainians are having here is that the dribble of supplies, especially of advanced uh, mechanized kit, hasn't been sufficient to allow the Ukrainians to conduct the large-scale counteroffensive that the West expects of them. And I think the West needs to recalibrate both its, what it's willing to provide and its expectations. Well, thank you so much. Dom and Francis, you've been listening to this. Um, Dom, do you have any questions? I do. Hi, Frederick. Thank you so much for joining us today. My question is about what you see as Russia's wider purpose now in the war. We see them, they've either transitioned onto the defensive down south or just doing a bloody good job of it. And they are making, there's still a lot of pushing and pulling up in the northeast and there have been some very local tactical advances by Russia up there. But it, it looks as if they are bedding down and looking to cement the lines as they are. So all aspirations of taking Kyiv and et cetera, et cetera, the whole of the country seem to have gone. Did, is that, would that be your assessment? Are they actually just trying to hang on to the land bridge as is at the moment and set a new, in their eyes, set a new reality? Well, I think militarily that's all that they can hope to accomplish right now. And so that's the military undertaking that they're engaged in. It's important to note that Putin has made it clear on multiple occasions that he has not actually abandoned any of his original maximalist war aims, which do include the, the change of regime in Kyiv and the destruction of NATO and a variety of other things that he's not in a position to achieve right now. But it's important to recognize that there's every indication that Putin has not reconciled himself to this is all that he's going to get out of the war, for the excellent reason, by the way, that it's very problematic for him to try to present this limited gain to the Russian people as a, as a satisfactory reward for the horrible sacrifices he's inflicted on them. Now, to the degree that reality impinges on Putin's consciousness, I think he probably understands that he's not going to take the rest of Ukraine by force right now, and so he's focused on breaking Western will. 
And I think that he really has, he's also realized that he's not going to break Ukraine's will, I think. But he is very focused on breaking Western will. And so I think that the Russian approach here is to uh, blunt this counteroffensive, stop it, possibly make some gains in the Northeast, although, as you say, it's not clear entirely what his purpose is there, and continue to work on separating the West from Ukraine and causing the West to abandon Ukraine and leave it vulnerable to renewed Russian efforts in the future uh, to gain all of his objectives in Ukraine, which he hasn't given up on. And this is, I think, what the West needs to be most concerned about, the tendency in some parts of the West to say, well, you know, I don't think the Ukrainians are going to win here. We really need to settle for some kind of stalemate and get the Ukrainians to negotiate. This is the fact that, first of all, it's exactly the effect that Putin is trying to generate. And second of all, he's indicated no willingness, actually, to negotiate on any serious terms. So I think I think he's focused here on splitting the West. So far, the West has not split and has been very resistant to that. But I think we're entering a potentially dangerous period where there, there may be a greater chance that he could succeed in that effort, which uh, would ultimately, I think, be, be very disastrous. Thanks. And just one more for me before Francis takes over. I've been trying to wrap my brains and, and try to account for Russia's very poor attempt to learn or no attempt to learn from the last year and a half. I mean, they, they are not dominating the sky. They are not dominating the Black Sea. If anything, they're being pushed back in the Black Sea by a country that doesn't have a navy. So I wonder if that political acceptance or the, the political capital that is expended trying to split the West politically, if that sort of bled through to the, the military machine to say that they don't really need to learn the lessons about how to try and dominate the sky, dominate the maritime domain. Is that, is that how you're saying it? Or they just, they've shown themselves to be a, not to be a learning organisation. I just wonder if, if that's still what's happening. Why are they still not able to knock out Ukraine's air power and sea power? Well, I think we've seen some Russian learning on the ground. The Russian, what the Russians are doing in the South is better than anything we've seen the Russians do before. And they have adapted in the ground campaign in several ways. So I, I don't think it's, a, I think it's a little bit too strong to say that they're not a learning organization at all. But I think, look, there, there are, you're talking in, in air warfare and naval warfare, you're talking about realms in which systems really matter. And you <laughs> There's a limit to which you can overcome technological problems or just basic problems with your systems in a short period of time just by learning. The Black Sea Fleet was not good. <laughs> I think we've discovered it was just not good. Its operational practices were not good, but more to the point, a lot of its kit just appears not to have worked. That's not necessarily something you can fix in a short period of time. And frankly, if I were the Russians, I wouldn't have prioritized that anyway, because this isn't fundamentally a war that's going to be decided at sea. In terms of air power, what the Russians have just shown a high degree of unwillingness to take a lot of losses in the air. You know, they have enough aircraft that in principle, I suppose they, they could overwhelm some of the air defenses that we've given the Ukrainians and the Ukrainians had, but the Russians don't have an actual viable uh, fifth generation stealth fighter. Uh, which means that all of their aircraft are vulnerable to the kinds of defensive systems that we've sent. They haven't had enough precision guided munitions or have not been able to use them well enough to suppress Ukrainian air defenses with those. And so the task would be flying their, their best fighter aircraft and pilots in disguise with active and very effective air defenses. There are not a lot of air forces that would be enthusiastic about that. So I, I think as long as the Ukrainian ground-based air defense remains as strong as it is, there's a limit to what I think the Russians can do unless they're prepared to see a lot of aircraft go down in a short period of time. And they've just shown themselves relatively understandably not willing to do that. And finally, I think if you ask the questions about what would really have dramatic effect if the Russians could fly or would fly their aircraft over the skies, it would be the large blackjack or bear bombers doing what they did in Syria as a sort of carpet bombing Kiev and so forth. The Russians, I think, are not willing to risk their nuclear-capable blackjack or backfire bombers because it's part of their nuclear triad, and the bears would just die. I mean, there's just they're not survivable in this kind of environment. So I, I really think there are a lot of te technological limitations here that, that militate against the Russians really working this stuff out 
as long as the West continues to give Ukraine the weapon systems, it will make this very difficult for the Russians. Thank you very much, Frederick, for your time. It's, it's great to have you on the podcast. We've been following your insights for a very long time. First of all, let's assume that Ukraine does achieve substantial military success in a prolonged counteroffensive. What impact do you believe that will have inside Russia? Would it be fatal for Putin in your view? Or do you think the economic impact of sanctions I was talking about earlier have been negated enough that it would allow him to continue to fight this war and potentially escalate it? I think there's no way for us to know. And I think that it's also important for us not to overestimate the impact that we can have on whether Putin stays or goes. And I think it's important not to imagine that that we can speculate on any of these things with any degree of confidence. Putin is clearly weaker than he was domestically by a lot at the start of this war. The Prigozhin mutiny was just one example of that. There are many others. On the other hand, there's no clear challenger to Putin. There are a number of power blocks in the Kremlin that have different views on the war that are pushing in different directions. I don't think any of them have an obvious successor to Putin. As always in Russia and most countries, the fear of chaos breaking out, Putin were to be removed, is as real or more real to the uh, Russian power brokers as it is to us. And that militates against action. So, look, it's very hard to tell. I don't think it's inevitable that Putin falls if he loses in Ukraine. I also think, in many respects, he's already lost enough that the question of his failing to survive the war is already on the table. And the reason for that is simply because the scale of the sacrifices and pain that he has imposed on his own people for what are, after all, very limited gains would put the continuation of any leader's regime at risk. So I think it's just not possible to know. And I think that there's too much discussion in the West that makes a lot of assumptions about these things that then bleeds back into Western thinking about what systems or capabilities or so forth we should provide to the Ukrainians or what objectives we should support the Ukrainians going after. And I I just think we should be supporting Ukrainians trying to regain their recognized territory, territory, by the way, that including Crimea, the Russian Federation explicitly recognized as belonging to Ukraine twice. Well, in that vein, knowing what we know now about Ukraine and Russia's capabilities, what do you think the West should have done differently as soon as the invasion began in February last year? We should have leaned in right away to providing Ukraine with uh, all of the material that it needed, not only to repel the invasion, but also to regain its territory. It had become clear within months of the full-scale Russian invasion that Ukraine was going to need Western tanks, that it was going to need long-range Western strike. In short, honestly, it should have become clear immediately that the West was going to have to replace all of Ukraine's Soviet era kit with Western kit because I have a newsflash for everyone. I'm reasonably confident that the Russian Federation is not going to be selling Soviet style kit to Ukraine anymore, you know? And the consequence of that is that the Ukrainian military is going to have to be shifted rapidly and fully onto Western kit. Frankly, that fact was apparent as soon as the invasion began. And the urgency of getting uh, that kit to Ukraine was also apparent very quickly. I think we went through a long period of um, negotiating with ourselves uh, on behalf of the Russians about what their red lines might or might not be. It turned out that all of the things we said were Russian red lines in terms of the kit actually weren't. And I think that has generated the effect that, of, as I said, being a day late in the weapon system short throughout this war. And unfortunately, we're still following that pattern. Does Ukraine need ATACMs, missiles on the U.S. long-range pursuit? Yes, it does. Does it need aircraft? Yes. Is the F-16 the optimal aircraft to give Ukraine? No, it isn't in many respects. But the worst aircraft to give Ukraine is no aircraft at all. And I think we've been too caught up in a lot of internal discussions and concerns and not focused enough on what was going to be necessary to help Ukraine achieve the objectives that President Biden has set, among other things, for our support for Ukraine. Where do you stand, therefore, on those who say that if the West had provided 
the kind of weapons from the get-go immediately the invasion began that would have led to some kind of escalation or that you know it would have potentially been quite risky for the western powers to have done that that this argument that it's the drip 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 whilst has been no doubt very frustrating for the ukrainians that this has had a strategically helpful impact in some ways because it's allowed for uh, Ukraine to get what it needs but without Russia ever being able to claim that some kind of red line has been crossed. Just interested in your perspective on that argument. I'm, I'm not interested in what the Russians claim because the Russians claim all kinds of things. Most Russian claims are fabricated anyway. What matters is what Putin wanted and what Putin wants. Did Putin want to get into a war with NATO? Absolutely not. We know that. Uh, we know that because Russian doctrine has been saying for years that Russia can't win a war with NATO, which is a true fact, and which a fact that Putin knows himself very well. So there's never been a point in this war when Putin would have seen it as advantageous to embark Russia on a war against NATO. And that whole discussion, I think, just fundamentally dis disregarded a large body of explicit evidence that the Russians knew perfectly well that was not a war that they could win, and that was not a good war for them to fight. So that sort of removes from the table, and always in my judgment did remove from the table, one of the escalation fears that was used to justify the drip. And the other escalation fear was that Russia might use tactical nuclear weapons. I would need to join you for another show because it's a much longer conversation to fully unpack why I'm very skeptical of the a fear that the provision of any specific weapon system or concentration of weapons would have triggered a Russian tactical nuclear strike in Ukraine. Um, bottom line arguments are, in the first place, Putin was trying to achieve military objectives in Ukraine, and those objectives were not served and still are not served by using tactical nuclear weapons. And beyond that, the only reason we continue to talk about Russia as a great power in the world is because of its nuclear arsenal and its nuclear threat. And in that context, if Putin uses a nuclear weapon in Ukraine and does not achieve a decisive outcome, he risks seriously devaluing the only thing that continues to keep Russia on the stage as a great power, which is incredibly important to him. And so I, th I think that makes his threshold for nuclear use very high and higher than I think some people have been uh, talking about it. So there's always a risk of escalation in any conflict. I think we've been very focused on the short-term risk of escalation and have been metering our aid to try to avoid a short-term risk of escalation. But the bigger risk of escalation, I think, lies in having the war protract. And that's something that I've, I've studied many times as a military historian. And you can begin to see it here as the activities in the Black Sea creep toward a sort of escalation. So I think the West really needs to turn around, and I do think actually an increasing number of Europeans are realizing this and say what's most important is that we end this war rapidly on terms that are acceptable to Ukraine and the West, and that allowing this war to protract is actually the most dangerous path to some of these escalation scenarios that people are worried about. Well, thank you very much. Frederick, can I just ask, I know Roland has a couple of very quick questions before we go to our final thoughts. And thank you so much for your time. We realise you've been speaking a lot. Thank you so much for answering all of our questions. Roland Oliphant. Hello, I'll be very quick. And I think you've, you've spoken to it, but I, I wanted to put things a bit more brutally. How do you explain this, what I would say is just a terrific failure of leadership in the Western world about this? The drip drip, the failure to deliver weapons, the failure to act on... Uh, information that was obvious to all of us months ago. I mean, everybody knew that, that shell stockpiles were going to run out, that shell production would have to be expanded, nothing's happened, that to go on the offensive, they were going to need to be supplied with extra kit, decisions kicked down the road, kicked down the road, kicked down the road, even though to any kind of dispassionate observer, it was absolutely clear much earlier than those decisions were taken what the decision had to be and how to do it. I'm just wondering what you put that down to and, and and is it a a kind of complacency do you think there's a kind of double think where you can on the one hand proclaim that this is a terribly urgent crisis and president biden can set all these goals which are quite ambitious and yet at the same time because we the collective west are not ourselves technically at war therefore we can carry on with business as usual 
Well, I, I think that we've been touching on what have been the fundamental problems in the way the West has approached this, which is that, look, the world changed very fundamentally when Russia launched its February 2022 full-scale invasion of Ukraine, and there's no going back. And that's a very uncomfortable thought. We're in a completely different world. Russia is the enemy. And Russia has done something to make itself a pariah and the enemy, even beyond the many other things that it had done before that. Um, but that has a lot of implications that are very unpleasant for the West. And I think that the West has been generally go slow to move through the, the stages of grieving and get to acceptance. That is the reality. And I think, look, I, I was there faster in part because I'd already come to that conclusion before the invasion, having watched what the Russians had been doing in Ukraine and elsewhere, and also listening to what they were saying. But I, I think it's just, it's a very unpleasant reality to come to. And the West, collective West has, has not wanted to get there. And I think there's still a holdover hope that somehow we can get back to some kind of status quo. Because after all, from the US perspective, we keep saying that our pacing threat is China. Before the, the full-scale Russian invasion, there were Department of Defense discussions about parking Russia, just setting Russia aside so we could focus on China. And we still keep talking about China as the pacing threat, which I understand, but it evinces a desire to wrap this thing up quickly so that we can focus on other things that we want to focus on. And I think all of that together is just comes from a failure to recognize how fundamental the change in the world that Russian massive invasion was and all of its implications. Again, I think, not surprisingly, the Europeans who are most directly affected by this change are getting there and realizing what it means. The Americans who are furthest from it and most preoccupied with other theaters are still being slow about it. But honestly, the faster that we can get all the way through the stages of grieving to acceptance of what the new reality that Putin has created actually is, the better off we all will be. Well, thank you very much, Roland. Dom, Francis and Frederick for your time today. Um, can we move to our final thoughts, please? Um, Frederick, you've been speaking a lot, so we'll give you a bit of a break. Um, Roland or Dom, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. My final thought today. So there's a new paper out today from RUSI, the Royal United Services Institute, new paper titled, uh, well, <laughs> the clue's in the title, The Ukraine War Has Found the Machinery of Western Governments Wanting. So Jack Watling, Dr. Jack Watling, we've had on the pod before, a very good guy uh, over at uh, RUSI. He's talking about and looking at Western government's mixed success in supporting Ukraine during the war. And the paper says that Western governments have spent basically spent decades writing long term strategies, but only ever managing small scale short term crises such as terrorist attacks. And Jack says that the institutional memory of how to cohere the operational level of war has atrophied. Uh, he says this malady is correctable, but only if we acknowledge that there uh, is a problem to be addressed, a bit as Frederick was just saying, to get through those stages of grief. Now, so Jack says Western government's constant deferring of logistics and other decisions could have been disastrous, but, and this is a quote, Russian incompetence in launching offensive operations in January, uh, February 2023, saved Ukraine's allies from the full consequences of their indecision. He says these delays are a feature, these Western delays, a feature, not a bug. And he says, just to finish, he says, it would be easy to blame these problems on politicians. Politicians always like to preserve decision-making space, but civil servants have also given the illusion of choice long beyond the point at which decisions have to be made. Now, that paper is online now on Roos's website. It's not behind a paywall. I suggest uh, we all go and have a have a proper, proper dig into that because I think that speaks exactly to what we've been discussing today and especially that last point there from Frederick. Thank you very much, Dom. Uh, Roland Oliphant. Hello. So I was going to say the same thing. I think Jack's paper from Rusi is, is essential reading and you can see the anger kind of pouring out between every line. I mean, the fact is... <laughs> Sorry to bang on about tanks, all right? I remember way, way back, beginning of the war, people were saying, what do they need? Maybe we should give them Western tanks. Um, and the answers were, all, oh, there's a lot of logistics involved in that. You'd need a big logistics supply line. For that. We'll, we'll build a supply line, was my response. I mean, no one's been um, really grasping this nettle for, from the beginning of the war. And I think the implication of this paper from Jack is it's no longer... 
possible to kick this can down the road and it may already have been kicked down the road too long because the lag on decisions of call it what you want total war or something like that building factories building production lines engaging in military kinesianism that they take time to put into effect ukraine may not have that time but it is quite possible that we've missed that window to be absolutely honest so yeah i, I completely endorse dom's recommendation that we should go and read that paper and my last point just, just off that and i kind of put it in my question just now it's about double think there is when you speak to western officials in different places in government or diplomats or other officials or something like that there is this strange sense that they are able to speak with profound urgency about how absolutely what a massive task it is that that, that the west faces and james cleverly can host an absolutely enormous reconstruction conference in london and have a, a great big garden party for everybody um and yet these really hard decisions these decisions about capital investment, about what your economy is going to look like, about saying, no, actually, we're going to have to spend money here or there. And what they just do not get made because at the same time, there's this sense of business, of u- as business as usual, that politics carries on as normal, that economics carries on as normal. And it really, really doesn't. If people want to actually win this war, if they want to live up to their proclamations about what they want, they have to actually act but there is an obviously parallel here with the climate change debate. But the fact is that this war, enormous though it is, is much more manageable and much more tangible a task than dealing with climate change. So if governments can't tackle this war, frankly, just forget about finding the leadership to deal with the bigger problem. Thank you, Dom and Roland. Uh, Francis Sternley, before we go to Frederick. Well, thank you, David. I echo Roland's frustration that he's just articulated there. It's been fascinating hearing Frederick's insights today. And it's it's got me thinking uh, again about how wars are often won through attritional warfare and extended campaigns rather than these brief, decisive engagements or, or battles, though history tends to neglect the former and fixate on the latter. And while I was away, I was doing some reading on this very subject. And if you look at the Napoleonic Wars, for instance, Dominic Levin in his book, Russia Against Napoleon, he stresses how historical memory focuses on a battle like Borodino, the one Tolstoy uses as a metaphor for the revival of Russian patriotism, despite the fact that it was far less important in the overall victory than the protracted campaign that lasted another two years beyond that. Tolstoy ends war and peace with the war only half over and the greatest challenges still yet to come. Ultimately, the long, bitter, but ultimately triumphant road was entirely marginalised. For every publication in Russian on 1813-14, there are probably more than 100 on 1812. It would be like writing an account of this war so far and ending it with Ukraine's Kharkiv counteroffensive last year. We hunger for this uncomplicated, decisive engagement, the turning point, as it were, whereas often that is the wrong way of looking at war. The 1813 and 14 campaign was arguably boring, uh, to use Levin's term, compared to Austerlitz or Borodino. But the key point is that boring battles were exactly what the Allies needed to fight. And any attempt to do anything too clever was bound to end in disaster. And in the same way, perhaps Ukraine has to fight a different kind of war now, one that doesn't draw the headlines in the same way as the counteroffensives we saw last year, but which is just as important, if not more so. Thank you very much, Francis, Dom and Roland. Um, Can we go back to our guest, Frederick, for your very final thoughts? And thank you so much for staying with us. It's been really, really interesting hearing your thoughts. And you may just have to unmute uh, to speak. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure and a very thoughtful and engaging show. I would just add to all of this that it's very important for the West to understand and remember that this is not an altruistic undertaking. The war that Ukraine is fighting is our war. Russia is our enemy, unfortunately. It's not because we want Russia to be our enemy, but because Putin has decided that we are his enemy. And the project of this war was always bigger than Ukraine. And the project of this war was also the destruction of NATO and dethroning of the collective West. This is a project that he's been pursuing for decades. And the, the fundamental question here is, 
Do we want to have the Ukrainians fight this war for us in Ukraine? Or do we want to have to be prepared to fight it ourselves on NATO territory? It's clear that it's very much in the West's interest to have the Ukrainians fight this war in Ukraine and not have to deal with it on NATO territory. And that's that's the trade that we are uh, currently making. And fortunately for us, the Ukrainians are willing uh, to do that. And I know that because they haven't been asking for us to fight this war for them. They've been asking for us to help them uh, fight it. But we need to understand that they're asking us to help them fight it for ourselves as well as for them. And I think this periodic notion that somehow there's an altruistic, major altruistic component here uh, has also been confusing us and holding us back from recognizing how urgent this is, not simply from a moral ethical perspective, because it is, and I don't want to downplay that. This is a genocidal war of aggression. The Russian purpose here is to destroy Ukraine as a state, as a people, as an ethnicity. It is a genocidal war of aggression, and there is a moral imperative here. But beyond that, there are hard geostrategic realities that make it very much in our interest to ensure that Ukraine wins this war and wins it in a way that it emerges strong enough to deter any future Russian leader from thinking about seeking to avenge Russia's defeat here. And this is what the West should be playing for now in its own interest, rather than risking solutions that can encourage the Russians to seek to avenge themselves sooner or from positions such as they now hold that would offer them a better prospect of success in the military endeavor. This, this is our war. Uh, this is the war NATO has been preparing for many decades. To our great fortune, the Ukrainians are fighting it for us brilliantly and not asking for more than our money and our equipment. And I think we need to understand that from, a, from our own self-interest perspective, we should be all in on that. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine the latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website, where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so that you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. If you want to hear Ukraine The Latest as soon as it is released, do refer to podcast apps. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app and... If you have a moment, leave a review, as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Today's Ukraine The Latest is edited by Rachel Porter. The executive producers are Louisa Wells and David Knowles.